we have the privilege today to hear Brian. Brian's here with us. He's going to be speaking. And I think it was 11 years ago, Brian had a conversation with me about the Holy Spirit that absolutely transformed my life. And uh, it was such a privilege to, to hear him then. And then for you guys to be here today and get to hear him talk about the Holy Spirit again, what a privilege it is. For those of you guys who had questions, and I had questions. The first time I, I heard about the Holy Spirit, I had a ton of questions uh, for Brian. Because I, I grew up in a, uh, I had been a Christian for probably 19 years and never had anybody ever really have a conversation with me about the Holy Spirit, uh, about Jesus, about the Father, yes. And, um, but th- that day when he talked to me about it, if this book was written, my goodness, it'd be amazing. Uh, Brian wrote a book. It's called The Baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, he almost sold all the books in the first service. So there's only seven back there. So if you, sitting down with this book is like sitting down with Brian for two hours and just listening to him talk about the Holy Spirit. It's absolutely incredible. But it is a privilege today to have him here and just be able to, to uh, have him share with us. So would you guys welcome my, my best friend? And uh, yeah, he's my, he's my best friend. Brian, we also had the opportunity that Brian was here for, I think, 10 years yeah. on staff. Full-time on staff, yeah. Is that it? Okay. Just had to make sure. He announced first service. He's like, I'm terrible with introductions. So, But it is, Adam, it is your 40th birthday. I love you. We honor you. We're grateful for you. You're one of the greatest pastors, leaders I've ever had the privilege to know and to be under. And, and even though I'm not on full-time staff, I still submit to your leadership. And so it's good. It's good to have that covering. So you guys doing all right? Awesome. Uh, I'm going to do my best uh, in this very limited amount of time and my own limited ability to share with you guys uh, in roughly 30 minutes what uh, I've been growing in myself for the last uh, two and a half months. Uh, usually what the Lord will do, for those of you that have may, maybe never heard me speak before, is uh, the way that God will usually deal with me is He'll have me camp in a place. Uh, sometimes He gives me a word for the year. Sometimes He'll give me a word for so many months, or He'll just give me a word in season. And that's kind of what this particular word has felt like, is ever since these last, for these last two and a half months, the Lord is it's almost as if He's had me camped in this one particular chapter and elsewhere. It all ties together. But it's almost like he, he, it's almost like I, I will wring the wring the rag dry. You know what I mean? I'll get every last drop out of it that I can. So my hope and my desire for you is that when I'm done, you wouldn't leave and say, "Wow, that was a really emboldened and passionate preacher." That's not my desire. Like my desire is that you're cut to the quick. Conviction hits your heart. That what can be shaken is shaken. You feel provoked and agitated because I do believe that's what God is doing right now in this hour. I believe there is a lot that has been exposed, not just in the world, but also in the church. And I believe we're living in a very interesting time and God is wanting us to respond rightly, okay? So let me just begin by saying this, um, and and I hope this makes sense to you, all right? So I said this, I guarantee you this service will look completely different than the first did. I, I don't even know how we got to where we were going in the first service, but... In Acts chapter 11, we, we read this very interesting story about a group of prophets that come down from Jerusalem to Antioch. Now what happens is, just to give you a little bit of a backdrop, a little bit of understanding, Stephen was stoned. Stephen was appointed by the apostles as a man full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And there was this dispute in Acts chapter 6 about caring for these Hellenistic Jewish widows. And Stephen was a man who was full of the Holy Spirit, full of faith, full of wisdom that even the people that were questioning, they couldn't cope with his wisdom. And what happened was he said a lot of things that they didn't really care for. And he stoned. There's a guy by the name of Saul who's there, who later becomes Paul, who's watching the coats of these people. But what happens is there's persecution and dispersion that takes place, all right? So there are these believers that go down to this place in Antioch, okay? So that's where we pick up the story. I asked the Lord to help me take my time uh, this service, and and I I feel His grace to be able to do that. So I want to nail some things down with you guys. So Michaela, if you want to put it up there, you can. I'm going to be in Acts chapter 11, verse 27, okay? Acts chapter 11, verse 27, It says, now at this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. All right, so here's, we're picking up the story. So there's this persecution, the believers are dispersed. Some are down here in Antioch. One of them named Agabus stood up and began to indicate by the Spirit. That's important because I'm sure everybody in this room would agree that without the Holy Spirit, there is no book of Acts. 
So I'd like to tell you where we are ultimately going this morning is to help you understand that the Holy Spirit, who is co-equal with the Father and co-equal with the Son, we need to understand this. Sometimes he's like a side conversation, but he's the conversation, all right? So we need to understand who he is and what he's wanting to do in the church and in our individual lives. He is never not the church's greatest need, guys. So picking up, one of them named Agabus stood up and began in Kate by the Spirit. That's a fancy way of just saying he heard from the Lord and began to prophesy to them. He's this prophet that came down from Jerusalem, and it says that there would certainly be a great famine all over the world. Say all over the world. Amen. Something has been happening as of late that has also touched the entire world. Would you agree? Now, this is my sense. I personally believe and feel convicted to the core that the world you once knew, you're no longer going to see again. When people talk about the new normal, I have no idea what that even means. But I can tell you this, even the way we do it has to change. If there's going to be a new normal in the world, which by the way, the green phase, I don't even know what that means. That's still not normal. So, the new normal in the world, whatever that means, must be met with the new demonstration in the church. There are some things in life, guys, that God will not just... And I'm talking about something that money can't buy. There are some things that hunger and thirst require for us to walk in and operate in. But what I want you to see is, because I think what happens in the church is we have been taught, we have been programmed, we have a default, and I think sometimes we react circumstantially more than we respond relationally to the Lord. So a lot of times what happens is a circumstance occurs, maybe a famine is coming that will touch the world, but what you don't read in this chapter is they don't call a prayer meeting to pray against it. What if God isn't wanting us to pray against something right now? What if he's wanting us to pray for something right now? What if our response, because guys, I'm going to be honest with you. I have seen a lot of big name ministers and ministries that are praying to see the end of something to very little to no result, in my opinion. So one of two things is afoot. But I think, I think, I think no matter what, whatever the answer is, there's still this sense of like, we still need a greater baptism in the Holy Spirit, period. So one of two things is afoot. Either we lack the power and the authority to stop what's happening right now in its tracks, or it's what God isn't wanting us to pray against right now or pray for. In either case, the answer is still the same, and it's we need more of Him on our life. We need to be close, guys. The Bible says... In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, here's the promise to you and I. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And I want you to know, thank you, Michaela, I want you to know those guys received it. When Jesus said in John 14, 12, the things I do, you will do, and more, they can say they did that. I can't. I personally, and we can argue theology and everything else, which I have very little interest in doing anymore. Because I believe, guys, it's not about our opinions. It's about a demonstration. And Paul said he fully preached the gospel in signs and wonders in Romans 15. In Acts chapter 8, it says that when Philip was down there witnessing to Samaria, it says they heard and saw the signs he was performing. And I believe, guys, it's no longer, and it never should have been in the first place, about our opinion. Either we can do this or we can't. They could. God, in a moment's time in that upper room, took cowards and, made, cowards and made them utterly courageous. He transformed them in an instant. So, 
you have this situation where this famine is touching the entire world and they don't call a prayer meeting to pray against the famine, they respond to it by sending relief to Judea. What if, what if it's not about, because I think there's a default in the church where we puff our chest and we begin to exercise our authority and we command and we decree. And guys, I'm tired of speaking to things that don't move. What if it's not about doing that? What if it's about humbling ourselves and saying, hey God, what's available for me to walk in and manifest, I'm not walking in and manifesting it. So let me just give you a little backdrop. Let me just take you on a tour through the book of Acts really quick to help you see and to understand that the person of the Holy Spirit is the most significant figurehead in this book. He guided and led their, all of their affairs. When you read this, you see over and over and over again, without him, this isn't even possible. And just so we're clear, Jesus made it abundantly clear when he said, hey, where I'm going, you can't come. His role shifted from what he was doing on the earth to represent us in a flesh body as high priest. That's his role right now, seated next to the Father. Would you agree? And he said, where I'm going, you can't come yet, but I will pray to the Father and he will send one that's like me. He's the one, he's the helper. He will be with you forever. He's the spirit of truth. He will lead you and guide you. He will take what is mine and disclose it to you. He will, the Holy Spirit, guys, is the greatest need in our life right now, not the end of a pandemic. If we come out on the other side of this thing looking no different than when we went in, we missed it completely. So I believe what's happening and the error that I have made in my life is I will get, I'll feel very convicted and I'll hunger and I'll thirst and then maybe I'll bump into something that I was hungering and thirsting for and then when I received what I was hungering and thirsting for, when I finally got to that place, that hunger and thirst that took me there began to wane because of what I got rather than provoking me to say, okay, but there's still more because even Paul said, I press on to the upward call. There's always more. Jesus said, follow me. You can't even follow him without having what I'm talking about. Like when I, I mean, I see Sarah Lauer, and I see Dave over here. Like when I think back to 2010 and what God did here, like it blows my mind and I want to see that stuff again. I want to see more of what I saw. The first miracle that I saw after I was baptized in the Holy Spirit when I was living, living in Mifflinburg was a child with an inoperable brain tumor got healed got completely healed. My wife worked alongside of her mother at the school, New Berlin Elementary School. We got the report. She, there was absolutely no hope. We asked if we could pray. She said, sure. So we went and we prayed. Doctors com completely healed. But the problem is I'll pray for a whole lot of other things and not see it move. And I don't want to have an opinion about signs and wonders. I don't want to sit there and talk about my theology around it. I don't even want to try to convince you that it's for today. I just want to move in it and operate in it. Those guys received something. And it, you know what? They had an opportunity. They witnessed guys and thousands would come to the Lord like that. You don't even have to be a long-winded preacher. All you need is the presence of God and you can preach. At Peter's sermon's probably two minutes long in Acts 2. So the effectiveness of your message is not in your words. It's in the presence of God in the message. So he pierced their heart. 3,000 got saved in a moment. But when you read this stuff, guys, like Acts chapter 2, where that's what we're celebrating today. We're honoring Pentecost. The church is remembering the day when 120 men and women were baptized in the Holy Spirit and fire because Jesus prayed, the Father promised, and it's Jesus who baptizes in the Holy Spirit and fire. The three are always working together. And those guys received tongues as a fire. Wind and fire came into the room. And all of a sudden, they began glorifying God in tongues that were not their own, languages that were not their own. They were never taught. And the people were like, this is strange. But Peter, by the Holy Spirit, knew that what Joel said is happening now. See, that's what the Holy Spirit will do. He'll take what God said and remind you of it. And now he begins, they, they begin 
preaching and, and, and Peter gets up and begins preaching and all of a sudden 3,000 are convicted and, and give their life to the Lord in one day's time. Then in Acts chapter 3, you have Simon and Peter, or Peter and John walk up to this man who's lame for 40 years at this gate called Beautiful. This story rocks me, guys. This guy can't walk. 40 years he sits out in front of the temple and begs, for, begs alms. And Peter and John walk up to him and say, look at us. Silver and gold we don't have, but what we do have, we give to you. See, do we have, the question is, do we have it? And you might say, well, you just need to believe it. Well, maybe. Maybe. You might say, well, it's a matter of you understanding your authority. Authority without power is nothing. Power validates your authority. Jesus said, all authority has been given to me, now you go. So it doesn't matter what authority you have unless you have the power resting on you to exercise the authority. You can preach the name of Jesus all you want. You can be like the sons of Sceva in Acts, I believe it's 17, 18, 19. It's around that place where they're trying to invoke the name of Jesus to cast out a demon out of this man, and they're not getting anywhere. Why? Because they lack the power and the ability to be able to see. That's what puts the devil on notice. You heard of Jesus of Nazareth, Acts 10, 38, who was anointed with the Holy Spirit and power, who went around doing good, healing all who oppressed the devil, for God was with him. Here's the question. How could Jesus do what he did? Because God was with him. How was God with him? In the person of the Holy Spirit. John chapter 3, Nicodemus comes up to Jesus. We recognize you're a teacher sent from the Lord because nobody could do the things you're doing unless God was with you. How was God with Jesus? In the person of the Holy Spirit. Hey, the same way the Father sent me, I'm going to send you. How was Jesus sent? He was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Born in the fullness of time, in the likeness of sinful flesh, under the law. In the same way like you and I now are born again by the Spirit. Raised. Jesus raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. You and I raised out of death, out of sin, in the power of the Holy Spirit. But then Jesus, guys, I think you know this. He did what he did, not as Jesus second in the Trinity, but Jesus son of man. That's important because he emptied himself, it says in Philippians 2. So he couldn't do a miracle. You might say, that's heresy. That's Jesus. He couldn't do one. Not until he received the Holy Spirit after he was baptized by John in the Jordan River and he comes up and the Holy Spirit, like a dove, he's not a dove. He's not wind, he's not fire, he's not oil. These are words we use to describe him because if you take that literal, then Jesus is a lamb in heaven. But he's not. These are words we're using to describe the ministry of the person of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus could do nothing until he was baptized in the Holy Spirit. Then he went out, then his ministry truly began. And he said, the things I do you will do, and more. And Brian Connolly can't say that that's true in his life. I've seen, I'm not downplaying what I have seen. I'm not downplaying the things I've seen God do. But what I'm saying is there is this weight that is resting on me, this conviction that has been resting on me since this pandemic, even before it started, that says I owe it to everybody in this room to be able to demonstrate the gospel. Because the world is looking for what only the Holy Spirit can give. And the way we're currently doing it isn't as successful and it's not working as well as it could be. And I felt like the Lord said to me one day, well, if you're not walking in it, then wait for it. And the church is bad at that. The church is really into just wanting to do ministry, really wanting to fill the space. What if we did a whole lot less talking and did a lot more praying? What if, what if, what would it look like for a body of people to say, Jesus, you promised that when you prayed, the Father would send the promise of the Holy Spirit. You heard that John baptized with water, but you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit not many days from now. I have no idea how many days not many days from now is. I know to him one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. I know there was a guy by the name of Simeon in the the book of Luke that was told, you won't see death until you behold the consolation of Israel. In other words, when you see Jesus... You won't die until you see that which was coming, that which was going to be the salvation of the people of God. I don't know how long that promise took, but he kept it. 
And all I know is this, guys, like, it's, I, I, am, I am in this place of saying, hey, God, like, we need an outpouring big time. The world is rapidly changing, and I am telling you guys, when the Holy Spirit, the Bible says the Holy Spirit will be poured out on all flesh. Does it say that? Acts chapter 2, verse 17. The Bible says in Hebrews that the ground that drinks the rain always brings forth its vegetation. In other words, rain exposes what was planted in the ground. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit not only falls on God's people, but all flesh. That's why you see the tares raise up with the wheat. So when the presence of God is here, it exposes what camp you belong to. But I know this, guys, like things are rapidly changing. Like it is not persecution for us to have to do online services. We are not in the day and time yet where they might point the finger in our face and say, don't you dare preach in this name. Or you heal a man for 40 years and now you're on trial with the religious people. We haven't experienced any of that yet. But I know this, guys, like fear, paranoia, suspicion is at an all-time high. Their trust in the government is failing. Trust in the people, trust in media is failing. What's going to happen if people show up at your door and they want to do something that you feel is unethical? What if they want you to put something in your body that you're not okay with? Then what are you going to do? See, we don't need something to stop. We need something to be clothed in. Do you know the, the presence of God was so strong in the book of Acts in chapter 5 that everybody around the church feared the church? Do, do you realize, like, everything in the book of Acts, like, when you look, and Peter, this, this, this story, man, hey, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? What kind of discernment and relationship with the Holy Spirit do you have to have for the Holy Spirit to show you that a husband and wife sold a plot of land, they kept back some of the money, they brought the money forward because they saw how Barnabas was honored and treated. And they thought to themselves, hey, we'll do the same. But Peter was able to discern through the Holy Spirit that these guys are keeping back some money. And so when Peter says, why has Satan filled your heart? It says Ananias breathed his last and he fell over dead. That's pretty serious. Why? Because the greater the presence of God, I can't go into this, but the greater the presence of God and the glory of God biblically, whether it's when they dedicate the, the, the tent of meeting and you have, Levi, or you have Aaron's sons bring false fire and it says what? They were consumed because the greater the glory, the swifter God's judgment. Every time. See, you don't even need to preach against sin when the glory of God is there. When Jesus performed that miracle with the fish, Peter fell over and said, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. Because the miracle exposed him. Like whatever's in the dark is going to come to the light. That's the judgment that came into the world, according to John 3. But it says that they went on in the fear of the Lord and God kept adding to their number. And from that time, it says, and I've been saying this a lot, so please forgive me. I know it sounds redundant. They brought the sick into the streets of Jerusalem, not the street of Ogons. The streets of Jerusalem were filled in hopes that Peter's shadow might pass by and heal them. Then it goes on to say in that same chapter at the end of verse chapter 5 in the book of Acts, they were, all the people were healed. You have Peter raising up a girl by the name of Tabitha, Paul raising from the dead, this boy that was listening to him preach, falling out of a third story window, raises him up from the dead. All of that stuff, guys, is in there, and it's all possible because of the person of the Holy Spirit. And I believe this. I'm still working on this, so please, like, if you disagree, it's fine. I totally get it. I believe the level of our infilling is proportionate to our level of surrender to God. And I think those guys had nowhere to go. They were in that upper room. They were scared. They thought they were going to die just like Jesus died. They lacked the power and the willingness to even be able to, 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 to but when, once they received that power in the book of Acts, once they received the power of the Spirit, they were willing to go and do that. But Jesus said, hey, what you let go of, you find. What you lose, you gain. Like, whatever you give up in this life, you get back twice as much. And, then, and I think what, because they, when he said, follow me, when they were all in, they were already positioned to be radically filled with the Spirit of God. So right around this time in, in uh, 
about two and a half months ago, the Lord had me camp. I'm going to do this fast. He took me to this story in Luke chapter 11. And this is where he's been having me uh, stay for two and a half months. And I'm going to, I'm going to do this with you guys uh, relatively quick, but I think, I think we'll get it. It says in Luke chapter 11, verse 1, it happened that while Jesus was praying in a certain place, after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John also taught his disciples. Now, I believe that what God is wanting to do in this hour is not only teach us how to pray, because there's different ways you can pray. There's supplication, there's meditation, there's petition, there's adoration. There's persistence, there's perseverance. I think God not only want, wants to teach us how to pray, I think right now he's wanting to teach us what we should be praying for. You'd be also hard-pressed to tell me that these guys had zero familiarity with prayer. It's not like they're starting from scratch. Like, to be in that time and in that era and, and to be a Jewish man, like, you'd be hard-pressed to tell me they weren't familiar with the importance and practice of praying. But I think what's happening here is I believe they're looking at the life of Jesus and they're saying there's something different about you. Somehow, some way, the intimacy that you have with God is different than anything we've ever seen and it translates into your life. Like, you're different. You live different, and we want in on it. What's going on? How can we be like you? I think that's what they're saying. Because again, John chapter 3, hey, Jesus, we recognize you're a teacher sent from God because nobody could do the things you're doing unless God was with him, you. And we know how God was with him in the person of the Holy Spirit. So he goes on then, and he talks about our Father, hallowed be your name, and we, we recognize this in the church as the Lord's Prayer, not so that we would say it on Sunday morning from a religious standpoint. I'm not going to get into this prayer per se, but what I want you to see is where it says in verse 5, then he said to them. In other words, he's still answering the question. The response, teach us how to pray, wasn't answered through the, our Father. In fact, the greatest response is in this parable he's about to tell then he said to them. So in the same breath of basically amen, he begins this sentence. Then he said to them, suppose one of you has a friend and goes to him at midnight and says to him, friend, lend me three loaves for a friend of mine has come to me from a journey and I have nothing to set before him. My goodness, there's a lot in those two verses right there. Let me just tell you this. Midnight is the darkest hour of the day. Contrary to popular opinion, Midnight is the dark. It's not, it's not twilight. It's not right when the, the sun is about to rise. It's at midnight. And I believe for a lot of people, it feels that way. I think for a lot of people, it feels very uncertain. It feels very dark. You and I are fortunate to live in such a conservative area. It is different from where my dad lives in Plymouth Meeting outside Philadelphia. There's a lot of fear, a lot of suspicion, a lot of stuff going on. And I think we get used to our bubbles sometimes. And I don't think it's suddenly going to change. I don't think things are going to go back to the way they were. What about the next pandemic? What about the fall that everybody keeps worrying about? When the coronavirus and the flu might mix together? What about the next whatever? Because when I read my Bible, it doesn't seem like things get better. It seems like they get darker. Now it doesn't scare me. It helps me to say, okay, like if there's going to be a greater outpouring, if there's a greater revival, if there's a revival that's supposed to bring in a billion soul harvest, if the latter glory is supposed to be greater than the former glory, the latter rain greater than the former rain, then I want to see that. And I want to commit myself to persistently praying until I have more of him on me. See, I don't want to just settle anymore, guys, for an opinion. Who cares what your opinion is on signs, wonders, whether God still does this today or not? Can you do it? When you pray for the sick, are they healed every time? Can you discern, like Paul, when there's a, a girl, a servant girl, practicing divination who's saying, these are men sent from God. Listen to them. It sounds right, but he knew it was a demon, and he cast it out. Or there was a guy that was hindering the work of, of Paul, and I may have been Silas or Barnabas at the time, and Paul takes his eyesight. That's in your book. I 
Or when it says in Acts 13, they were continuously filled with the Holy Spirit and joy. And when Paul says in Ephesians 5, be filled with the Spirit, that's a command. That's a commandment. Or when you're Peter and the religious leaders are questioning you and what authority you did that in and stop preaching in this name. And it says when he opened his mouth, it says Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. It's not past tense, Acts 2. When he opened his mouth, he was filled. Why? Because Jesus said, don't worry in that day what you're going to say for it will be given to you by my Father. How's it given? Through the Holy Spirit. All of our communion with God is through him. There's only three times in the Gospels where you hear the Father speak, but now it's the Holy Spirit that takes what he hears and discloses it to us. It's the Holy Spirit that tells Cornelius, hey, send for this guy named Peter. He's in Joppa. Because your alms and, and your, the fear that you walk in with me, it's been heard, it's been honored, and this guy's going to come and preach the Gospel. Or about Philip, hey, there's a guy up there. Why don't you walk up to that chariot and witness to him? Do you know, I told this to the first service, Ethiopia traces the fact that it's a Christian nation to that conversation, historically. If Philip wouldn't have gone up there, who knows where they would be. So starting from Isaiah to Jesus, he preaches the gospel to him, because he's reading from Isaiah. Help me understand this. Then he baptizes him, and then guess what? All of a sudden, Peter, Philip's not there anymore. The Holy Spirit takes him and puts him somewhere else. That's, that was normal. Angelic visitation was normal. Prison doors opening up were normal. Hearing God's voice was normal. So clear and responding to it so clearly. Suppose one of you has a friend. Now what else is midnight? Midnight's the dawn of a new day. I believe God is wanting to do a new thing. So here's the deal. This guy has this visitor show up at midnight. That is an unassuming, totally caught off guard moment if somebody shows up at your house at midnight, is it not? And what this guy's arrival does is it reveals to the guy who receives this visitor what he doesn't have. And I think that's exactly what this moment has done. I think this moment in time has shown a light on where the church is and what it currently is operating in and walking in, myself included. But here's what I love. This guy shows up, probably famished from his journey because they weren't hopping in their car and doing 65 to visit each other. This guy realizes in that day and time, it's cultural to care for a guest. You receive a guest, they come into your home. That's like you making a covenant with them. And it is shameful if you don't have the opportunity or the ability, I should say, to be able to feed such a person. So the visitor's hunger provokes a hunger in him to say, I need to go and get something. Now, here's not what it says. Or could, let's, just, let's just imagine ourselves in this situation for a moment. Let's say you're at home, it's midnight, you're either asleep or you're binge-watching some show, whatever you're doing at that hour. There's a rap at your door. You go and you answer the door. It's a friendly face, a face you haven't seen for a while because it says he's a, he's a friend. You guys haven't seen each other for a while. You embrace, you invite the person in, and because you're a good host and because you can see that he's tired and this person is famished, you want to be able to feed them, and then your brain reminds you, oops, the pantry's empty. But that's okay because you have an opinion. You know how bread should be made. You know how it should taste. You know that what bread pairs well with this meat and this cheese. In fact, you just had a sandwich five hours earlier and you can't wait to tell the guy about it. No, it sounds ridiculous. He doesn't want your opinion. He wants a full stomach. He doesn't want your experience. He wants his own. And so the confrontation, I believe this whole thing's been a divine confrontation. The confrontation is this, either you have bread or you don't. The three loves is not on accident. It's the, it's the love of the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Without him, we have nothing to give. Without God, you have nothing to set before anybody. But this guy is so provoked by what he doesn't have, at least he knows where to go to get it. 
Now here's the difference, I believe, is for a lot of, a lot of us, maybe, I, I know I put myself in this category, I think a lot of us, we've gone to the Lord for what we can get from Him. Maybe there's a certain gift or this or that, or maybe we wanted to have a certain experience with Him, and I'm not saying it's wrong. What's interesting in this story is the guy goes and asks for bread, not for himself, but for the visitor. That's the difference this time around. We owe it to them to have something to give them. And if we don't have it, let's stop kidding ourselves. Let's stop saying, be healed in Jesus' name and nothing changes and walk away and say, well, that's on me, I need to grow, and then not do anything about it. Not continue to hunger and thirst till it changes. I am so guilty of praying and then settling for a truth but not seeing it manifest in my life. when I know we owe it to the world. Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come to me for a journey and I have nothing to set before him. You see that? Without him, you've got nothing. And from inside, he answers and says, do not bother me, the door has already been shut and my children and I are in bed, I cannot get, get up and give you anything. Okay, so now you have this visitor show up at your house, it's midnight, it's audacious, I know. All of a sudden, you're like, I've got nothing to feed my guests with, but I'll go over to this guy's house and I'll knock on his door and see if he has anything. Now here's what's so interesting. It's because he's his friend that he goes and does that. See, friendship opens up and invites you to come and knock. But it's not always friendship that moves the hand of God. His favor is towards you, I understand that, because you're his friend. But not everybody in the room can also say that just because we sing the song doesn't mean we're his friend. But in this instance, it's not friendship that moves God. It's God in this story who's replying, do not bother me, the door has already been shut, and my children and I are in bed, and I cannot get up and give you anything. And I'll show you that when Jesus ends the parable. This is the God figure in the story. He goes on to say in verse 8, I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend. Did you see that? That's not why he's getting up. It's not because he's his friend. Why? It's because of his persistence. In other words, the guy doesn't stop asking. He doesn't stop seeking. He doesn't stop knocking. He's so bothered by what he doesn't have that he knows this guy has it and he's going to continue to knock until he gets it. That's weird. It's midnight. I would never do that to a neighbor. And I've got neighbors that are friends. I wouldn't even do that to Adam. I'd say, we'll go hit a diner tomorrow morning. We'll just have to sleep on it. But do you see how concerned the guy is? It's so shameful that he has nothing to feed the man. But it's not because he's his friend, it's because he just won't stop. And this is where I've dropped the ball. I've dropped the ball when it comes to persistently asking for what Jesus said we should be asking for in verse 13 of this chapter. So I say to you, Jesus said, ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open to you. You'd think that would be enough to keep us going. He promises it'll be yours. If you keep asking, seeking, and knocking, if you're persistent, do you remember that parable in Luke 18 where Jesus said, hear the words of the unrighteous judge? What did the judge say? Give this woman what she wants lest she wears me out. Because persistence proves what you really want. That's where we find out if you have the grit, if you have the resolve, if you mean what you say. When we stop persisting, faith was never in the equation. You persist because you believe that your persistence is going to do something. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be open. Now suppose one of you fathers is asked by his son, for a fish, he will not give him a snake instead of a fish, will he? Or if he has asked for an egg, he will not give him a scorpion, will he? If you then being evil, if you then being an imperfect parent. Now we're talking about a heavenly father here, a perfect father. If good fathers, if, if imperfect parents know how to give good gifts to their children, what do you think the heavenly father, a perfect father, wants to give? 
If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? So, this is what I believe is happening here in this story. Hey, Jesus, teach us how to pray. Going all the way back to the beginning. Because when we look at you, we see something different. You have a communion that we've never seen before, and we feel like that translates into your life and how you live, and we want to be like you. Would you tell us your secret? Because John taught his disciples. And I feel like what Jesus is saying is, you want to know why I am the way I am? You want to know why I do what I do, why I'm able to pray how I pray? Do you know the Bible says that we don't know how to pray as we should? but it's the Spirit who helps us, Romans 8. Do you know the Holy Spirit has a mind according to Romans 8? Do you know the Holy Spirit has a will according to 1 Corinthians 12? He distributes the gifts as He wills. Do you know He hears and He speaks? Do you know He has emotions that you can grieve Him and afflict Him? Do you know you can live in such a way that attracts Him and repels Him? It's like Jesus is saying, if you want to know why I am the way I am, why I do what I do, why I stop where I stop, why I share what I share, why I speak what I speak, then I want you to ask for the one that I'm clothed in. You heard of Jesus of Nazareth, whom God anointed with the Holy Spirit and power, who went around doing good, healing all, who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. The same way the Father sent me, I'm now sending you. Guys, if you want me to tell you what I feel like the Lord is up to in this hour, it is not that the church would rally and pray against this pandemic. It's that the church would humble herself and say, what I am currently walking in isn't enough. I have a lot of opinion and not a lot of demonstration. I've been taught how I should respond and I'm not relationally responding. I'm reacting because it's not going the way I want it to go. And I've been puffing out my chest and commanding and decreeing, but I'm not really seeing a whole lot. And I personally believe that what God is wanting us to do is to come before him and say, okay. Okay, you promised that I would receive power and I'm not walking it in the measure that I should be. I'll end with this, this. Acts chapter one, verse 14. They continually devoted themselves to prayer and they were of one mind. We know that unity blesses the Lord. We know that God pours out on unity. It's like oil poured out on Aaron's head, it gets down into the beard. I believe the church is only ever unified when it's about one thing. If it's about everybody's opinion and everybody's stuff and everybody's this and that, there's not a whole lot of unity unless it's all geared for the same purpose, which is to make the Lord famous and to proclaim him and give him honor and glory. But I see in this particular instance, they were of one mind, continually devoting themselves to prayer, but what were they praying about and what were they of one mind concerning? What they were waiting for. That's where the unity was. Continually, night and day, devoting themselves to prayer as they waited for what God had promised. What would it look like for the church to genuinely wait and to continue to wait? I'm not saying that there are those of us in the room that aren't baptized in the Spirit. What I'm saying is, I believe, if I'm reading Acts chapter 2 and then Acts chapter 4, what did they get in Acts 4 that they didn't get in Acts 2? Why are they continuously filled with the Spirit and joy if there's not greater levels or more to walk in or more to manifest? So what would it look like for the church to gather around one thing, be of one accord. That's one accord means to see the same, the benefit of like, to, to look at it and say, okay, I agree with that and we're going to do that thing. That's what it means to be of one accord. One mind, one pursuit, one heart. Jesus, we desperately need what the Father promised, which you performed since you're the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. That's why we're doing what we're doing Thursday nights. That's why we're gathering. It's not about how many show up, it's about an outpouring. And I know a lot of times, like we say that from a very insecure place, well, it's not about the numbers, and we feel the need to say it's not about the numbers because we feel insecure about the numbers. But I'm telling you, I could care less right now about the numbers. What I care about is an outpouring. What I care about is the church saying, the world around us is changing, and it's never going to go back to the way you used to know it. 
And we owe it to everybody outside of there and inside here, my family, my friends. We owe it to the people to not just speak, but to be able to demonstrate. My word, my, my preaching were on persuasive words of wisdom, but a demonstration in spirit and power. The kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. Now, God can anoint your words, and absolutely, people, you see that in Acts chapter 2. But I think we need a demonstration, a greater demonstration than what we are currently walking in. So my prayer in closing would be this, that you literally would be haunted by what was said today. That you can't escape it, that you literally like, God would, see, because if God didn't convict you, you'd stay the same. You would never change. If God didn't shake you out of your apathy, if God didn't shake you out of just your sleep, your slumber, and I think to an extent, I've been lulled to sleep. And I think God is waking people up because when you're asleep in here, you're no good out here. The reason why it says awake, sleep, and rise from the dead is because when you're sleeping in here, you're dead out here. You're of no use to anybody. And you can have an opinion and you can tell stories, but I don't want just opinions and stories. I want to see him do something. So I'm, I'm going to pray that that conviction rests on us. I'm going to pray that God stirs us. I'm going to pray that literally we'd, be, we'd feel so agitated and that our time right now, if God is wanting to teach us how to pray and what to pray for, that literally we would see what Jesus is saying in Luke 11 and say, okay, I'm not going to back off. I'm going to continue to pursue you, Holy Spirit, not just for power's sake, but so that you'd form your humility because you take of what is Jesus and you give it to me. I need his joy. I need his humility. I need his countenance. I need his disposition. I need his mind. So that's what I pray right now, Father, in the name of Jesus. I pray that you would convict us to hunger and thirst like never before. That the conviction of the Lord would rest upon us. That, Holy Spirit, you would stir us out of our apathy. That you would make us not okay with our opinions. God, that we would see it's not about knowledge that puffs up, but it's about a love that edifies. And until the love of God is shed abroad in our heart through the Holy Spirit, we're not even able to do what it is you're calling us to do. We're not even able to love our neighbor as we love ourselves or to love you first. Everything in the Christian life is from the Holy Spirit performing it in our lives. So I pray that we would deepen our surrender to you. I pray that we would see our need of you because the more we see our need, the more we surrender. The more we surrender, the greater filling we can have. The more filled we can be. And I'm praying, God, that your conviction would rest upon us to say, okay, if I'm not walking in it, I'm going to wait on it. I know there's more available. I know there's more of you to have. I know there's a greater baptism in the Spirit. Teach the church how to tarry again, God, and how to wait on the promise of the Father. Make us to wake up. Make us to be people of grit and persistence that don't take no for an answer. That say, I will continue to ask and seek and knock, albeit bloody knuckled and with a hoarse voice. I will continue to storm heaven's gates and say, you said this would be, you'd give it to me. And it says, how much more does the Father want to give it? But I know this, I know that the church is unified in waiting. I know that the church has much more of an appreciation for what it receives when it waits on it. And I know that you teach us dependence on you when we wait. Because unless you give it, we're not going to get it. So make us to be dependent on you. Make us to see the incongruence in our life. Make us to see the book of Acts and say, that's what's possible. The things I do, you will do and more. And the only way that's possible is because Jesus is going to pray to the Father. John 14. Then he'll send the helper. In other words, one who's like me. And you'll recognize him because he was on me. But the world won't recognize him. Because that's all the world is. The world is just people who don't know God. That's it. But the spirit of truth, he'll come. He'll lead you, he'll guide you, he'll comfort you, he'll empower you, he'll speak to you. How are you not our greatest need? How are you not the one we want? Teach the church to pray again. Teach us to be slow to speak and quick to listen. Teach us to humble ourselves and say, you're what I want, you're what I need. Father, I pray this Pentecost Sunday 
that you would arrest our heart, that you would help us to see your, this, is, this is what the Spirit of God is saying. Without bread, we have nothing. So I believe the world is hungering, the world is looking for a demonstration, and your conviction and that weight of responsibility is falling upon us. I pray that we wouldn't be crushed by it, but I do pray we respond to it. Father, thank you for everyone gathered. Thank you for your love. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for forgiveness of sins. Thank you for communion with you. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for the invitation to approach that throne to find help. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. I'll end this prayer by saying this. The Father is seated in heaven. Jesus is at his side. The Holy Spirit is the one who's here. The Holy Spirit is the one who's here. He's the one we need to commune with. He's the one we need to know. He's the one who glorifies Jesus to us. Signs and wonders are performed to honor and glorify the word of his grace. Where the spirit is, Jesus is always lifted up because he testifies about him. So the Holy Spirit will make Jesus famous both in the church and in your life. And we ask and pray that you would do that, Holy Spirit. To the best of our limited ability, we say we love you. Help us to know you. Help us to be clothed with you. In Jesus' name, amen.